Mario in an RPG. <laughs> like that would ever work, is what I would have said if this were the early 90s, but according to my calendar I bought and haven't changed since 2004, it is in fact the year 2004. Wait, what the fuck? Okay, so let's just pretend it's 2004, I, I, I guess. No, at this point, the idea of Mario starring in a role-playing game is kind of old news. Basically, the whole wow factor of it is gone. I mean, we were originally introduced to the concept in 1996 with Super Mario RPG. Then we got a spiritual successor four years later with Paper Mario, and just recently, a completely new Mario RPG was released with Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. That's like three completely different Mario role-playing games released within a span of eight years and apparently there's already another one on the way with a sequel to Paper Mario. What I'm trying to say is this is no longer Mario's first RPG rodeo. Seeing Mario star in a role-playing game just doesn't carry the same weight as it did back in 1996. We've seen this all before, so how the heck is a sequel to the original Paper Mario gonna stand out from all these other games? I mean, is there even much more they can do with this kind of formula? Oh, you bet your ass there is. Even though it was one of the last games Nintendo published on the N64, the original Paper Mario was an absolute hit. It took everything that RPGs were known for and gave it all a unique Mario twist. You see, instead of trying to adapt Mario into an RPG like Super Mario RPG did, Paper Mario attempted to do the opposite and adapt the RPG genre into a Mario game. They did this by stripping away what made a typical RPG so daunting for newcomers and focused on making it as beginner friendly as possible. You know, kind of like how anyone can pick up a Mario platformer and have a good time. They wanted to do that same thing, except with RPGs. Yeah, this meant Paper Mario was extremely easy, but more importantly, it was just fun. Honestly, all Nintendo and Intelligent Systems had to do at this point was do what almost any sequel does and just iterate on what came before it. Add some new characters, chapters, maybe raise the difficulty a bit, and BAM! The easy sequel that probably would have sold just as well as the original. But Intelligent Systems wasn't interested in doing a simple iteration, no. They wanted to completely surpass what came before it. Paper Mario 2 was announced at the Game Developers Conference in 2003 and looked to be, well, exactly what the title said it was, a sequel to Paper Mario. The reveal trailer was about a minute long and showed off pretty much everything you'd want to know about this game. There's apparently a big old dragon, new partners, new locations, peach in a bathroom, why? We also got a look at the updated art style, which apparently wasn't always a thing. Instead, early on in development, the game was meant to share the same art style as its predecessor, but eventually eventually adapted this new style. This new style, I like it. A lot, actually. It keeps the simplicity of the original while also making everything look more clean and iconic. I'll always have a soft spot for how the first game looked, though. Like, he just looks so cute, I just want to <laughs> squeeze him and... Oh god, what have I done? The game was then shown off at E3 2004 with a playable demo, then a few months later it finally released with a name change as Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Surprisingly, they completely dropped the Mario Story branding that the Japanese version of the first game had, and instead chose to use the Paper Mario name worldwide. It, kinda weird to completely rebrand your series on only the second installment, but uh, oh well, I, I guess Paper Mario is a more fitting name. Now, you probably don't need me to tell you this, but Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door did absolutely amazingly at launch, and to this day is considered to be not only one of the greatest Mario games, but one of the greatest games in general of all time. The Thousand Year Door is one of those legendary games, one of those games that's kind of in a league of its own, and well, just like the first Paper Mario, I've never fully played through this one on my own. Going into games of this caliber completely blind can be a bit... intimidating. It's like I'm critiquing goddamn royalty here for fuck's sake. Stuff like this usually goes one of two ways. Either the game lives up to the hype and you walk away with an understanding as to why it's so critically acclaimed and can finally sit at the cool kids table. Or on the flip side, the game fails to meet your expectations that were set so unrealistically high from the start and now you're on a bunch of people's shit list for the rest of your life. Basically, I don't want my opinion to be swayed either way before I've even had a chance to try the game myself. 
myself. So I'm gonna try my best to disconnect myself from all the Paper Mario fans that won't shut up about this game and go in as neutral as possible. So let's forget everything we thought we knew about this game and finally check out Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. The game starts by telling us about some garbage city that once upon a time was hopping and bopping until, uh oh, Jenga, your city's fucked. Afterwards, they decided to build a new city on top of the old one and called it Rogueport. Rumors then started to spread about some kind of treasure hidden deep underground behind something called the Thousand Year Door, but sorry to kill the good vibes, fellas, I already checked and there ain't shit back there. Cut to modern day and Rogueport is a straight up shithole, and just in case you couldn't tell, they put this happy little reminder right in the center for you. So Princess Peach is roaming the streets for whatever reason and manages to score a sick little box with a treasure map inside. Then we're taken to the Mario household where even Nintendo admits they sometimes run out of ideas. Mario and Luigi then receive a letter from Peach with the map included and she asks them to make a trip to Rogueport to help find the treasure. So we arrive at Rogueport, run into a shady group known as the X-Nots and learn that we need to find the seven crystal plot MacGuffins to open the thousand year door and also Peach gets kidnapped again but who the hell cares anymore? But yeah the the Thousand Year Doors plot is a pretty big step up compared to the original. I mean, that game was basically just, aw oh, shit boys, he's at it again. Whereas the story in this game is a lot more fleshed out and engaging. Everything just feels more monumental here, which helps keep you invested throughout the entire adventure. In the first Paper Mario, outside of the little self-contained stories each chapter had, I just didn't really care. Like what, it's not like they're ever gonna have Mario fucking die or something unexpected like that. You could tell right from the start that it was nothing more than your typical Mario plot. Collect all the things, stop Bowser, save the princess, the end. Paper Mario 64 was predictable and only did just enough to get the job done in terms of plot. The Thousand Year Door, on the other hand, has so much more going on. Like, there's always this sense of mystery, like, ooh, what's behind the big old door? Or who are the x dots Or why did they kidnap Peach? This is all stuff that kept me playing just so I could find out all of the answers. There's quite a few reveals that I didn't see coming as well. Like, there's some pretty well thought out and heavy aspects to the story. It's all stuff you wouldn't normally expect from a story in a Mario game of all things. The Peach sections from the first game return, except now they involve Peach teaching a computer about love, and, and honestly, it's adorable. But who the hell cares? You get to play as fucking Bowser, baby! I love these sections so much. You'll either play a 2D side-scrolling level or explore a specific area as you try and hunt down Mario. They don't add much to the overall plot, instead they're basically just brief intermissions where you get to laugh at how much of a fucking goober Bowser is. Bowser has always been a bit of a goof in every Mario RPG, but The Thousand Year Door was the first game to really nail Bowser's characterization. Honestly, it's a shame there isn't a paper Bowser or something that's just an entire game of these sections. Bowser seriously gets some of the best lines. I just hate that there's only a handful of these segments throughout the entire game. Gameplay-wise, The Thousand Year Door plays almost identically to the first game. You'll be exploring an interconnected 3D world as you solve puzzles and battle enemies. It's all just as enjoyable here as it was on the N64. However, everything, and, and I mean everything, has received some kind of upgrade. Battles feature more depth, exploration is made more interesting with new upgrades that give you new ways to traverse the world, and any one of these third things that I'm too lazy to pick. There's just so many 
improvements made to the formula here. Like take action commands for example, Paper Mario's bread and butter. You select an attack and then do a specific action to deal even more damage. That whole system is still here and is also available from the very start, thank god. But now in addition you also have stylish moves. You see, after you perform an action command, pressing the button again at a precise moment will have Mario or your partner doing something flashy to spice up the attack. <laughs> Shit, did you see that? He fucking spun, what the hell? Each attack can be followed up with a stylish move. However, the game never tells you when you'll need to press the button in order to perform these moves. It's completely up to you to figure it out. There's always a distinct rhythm to it though, and some attacks even allow you to chain a bunch of them together, and it feels so satisfying to pull off. It gives the combat this almost rhythm game feel, I, I don't know how else to explain it really. Now the stylish moves are entirely optional, but their purpose ties into another new mechanic that adds even more depth to Paper Mario's battle system, the audience. The first Paper Mario featured this stage play aesthetic for its battles, and it was honestly pretty charming. But the Thousand Year Door takes it to a whole new level, with battles literally taking place on a stage complete with an audience judging your every move. You see this counter here? This shows how many people are currently watching the battle. The more people watching, the faster your star power rises, which allows you to use certain special abilities. You can slowly increase the amount of audience members by correctly performing action commands, but you can get even more by also performing stylish moves with each attack. This is such a clever system since it incentivizes you to really focus on each battle and play your best in order to please the masses. In addition, if you time your action commands correctly, you'll sometimes have the opportunity to play this roulette minigame to get a huge boost in battle. There's just so much more going on here compared to the previous game, like I didn't even mention how if you don't pay attention, the the audience or even the stage itself can damage you. All of this combined keeps you on your toes in each battle and gets rid of almost all of the tedious waiting that some other turn-based games can have. And it does all of this while still maintaining that beginner-friendly feel that the Paper Mario series is striving for. Like the first game, the Thousand Year Door is still remarkably easy, but it's also a much more engaging experience than its predecessor ever was. Now, just like, well, most Mario games, I, I guess, the Thousand Year Door features eight distinct worlds or chapters. Like I said in my Paper Mario 64 video, the locations and scenarios featured in each of the chapters in that game were without a doubt my favorite part of the entire experience. They were just so charming and pretty much made up for the otherwise lackluster overarching plot. However, those were nothing compared to what the Thousand Year Door has to offer. You see, while the original Paper Mario had some super memorable moments, like Tubba Bubba for example, they were always pretty grounded in the Mario universe, so like nothing ever made me go, wait what the fuck is this doing in a Mario game? The Thousand Year Door on the other hand goes completely off the rails. You'll get your identity stolen from a shape-shifting ghost, get into a shipwreck with a crew of pirates, and even play detective on a train as you try and find a suspect that threatens everyone with the, with a, Sticky, yummy, doom. Listen, I, 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 don't, I don't kink shame, but come on. However, while the premise of each chapter is more interesting than the first games, the pacing is a whole different story. I just feel like there were too many instances where certain sections would come up as tedious or overstay their welcome. Like take the Glitz Pit in Chapter 3 for example, one of my favorites in the entire game. It's this big fighting tournament where you'll not only be participating in the tournament, but also trying to solve a mystery involving various participants that have gone missing. The concept is just so distinct, but sadly it starts to drag after a while as you're forced to do battle after battle in the tournament while small clues regarding the mystery are lightly sprinkled in. 
I just feel like this could have worked so much better if most of the chapter wasn't padded out with all of these tournament matches. They seriously could have cut out like half of them. They do at least try to keep it interesting by having each fight feature specific win conditions, such as only using your hammer, but that only does so much to relieve the issue. This isn't the only example of a chapter becoming overly tedious either. Chapter 2 will have you leading these small Pikmin-like creatures through a large dungeon. While it seems like an interesting concept at first, it'll start to wear on you as you wrestle with some questionable AI and solve these extremely basic puzzles that mostly just consist of weighing down various switches. Then there's the backtracking. My god, the backtracking. There's bits of it throughout the entire game, but the worst of it comes in Chapter 7. Basically, you need to find these two bob guys to activate a cannon for you. So, you find the first one fairly easily, since he was literally just in the last chapter you played. But then there's General White. Who the fuck is General White? Am I supposed to know who this guy is? Uh, frustrated, I, I look him up just to see what he looks like, and oh, it's that guy. He, he was in the village from the first chapter. So I quickly go all the way there, and wouldn't you know it, he just fucking left. The mayor says he apparently wanted to go to a more tropical location, so I go all the way to this tropical island, but guess what? Just missed him. You have to backtrack to pretty much every past area until eventually the game goes, <laughs> you actually fucking did all that backtracking? He was in his house the whole time, you fucking dumbass. Like, it's played off as this kind of big old gag, I, I, I guess, but it's just not fun to play and completely stops the game's momentum dead in its tracks. It's like they were forced to make each chapter the same length, so they threw in sections like this just to meet that quota. However, issues like this honestly end up feeling like nitpicks, especially when you take a step back and look at each chapter as a whole. They all feature themes and locations that honestly feel so out of place in the Mario universe, but that's ultimately what makes them so appealing. Everything just has this quirky feel to it. Gone are the generic deserts and jungles Mario is known for. Instead, they're replaced by locations like a shady port town inhabited by pirates and bandits, or a mysterious forest with these beautiful shades of blue and purple that perfectly contrast with the monochromatic foliage found throughout the area. It's all a complete departure from the Mario formula in terms of level theming and makes for an incredibly memorable experience. But anyways though, that's, that's all fine and good, but what would a Paper Mario game be without partners? Don't answer that. This time around, we've got Goombella, the aspiring archaeologist, Koops, the shy Koopa, Flurry, the uh, washed up actress, I, I guess. Uh, there's a peppy little Yoshi, which you get to name. I name mine Goobert. Vivian, also known as the best partner in the entire series. Bobbery, a retired sailor. And a partner who is completely optional, Miss Mouse. She's a mouse who's also a thief. Neat. While I enjoyed the cast of partners in the previous entry, when you start to compare them to the Thousand Year Doors partners, they would start to look a bit one-dimensional. Paper Mario 64's partners felt more like tools rather than living, breathing characters. They pretty much existed solely to give Mario new abilities. However, that is not the case at all with the partners in the Thousand Year Door. Like, most of them have actual character arcs, like Vivian overcoming an abusive family relationship and Bobbery, who is struggling to... Uh, actually, you know what, I, I don't want to spoil that one. Honestly, these are some of the best characters in the entire Mario series ever. Mostly because, well, you know, they, they have actual personalities that aren't just... <laughs> that. Now, I could go on and on like this and list every little improvement the Thousand Year Door made over its predecessor, but I think you get the point by now. This game is the exact definition of what a perfect sequel should be. 
It literally takes every aspect of the previous entry and improves upon it in some meaningful way. The plot is more engaging, battles feature more depth, and partners are a lot more fleshed out. Not only that, but it completely goes against the Mario formula. Like, what other game can you see Mario stand next to a noose while someone gets the shit beat out of them in the background by the Mafia? It all just feels so weird but like in the best possible way. In defying what we've come to expect from the series, it reignites what made the original Mario RPG so exciting back in 1996. It's unlike any other Mario game out there. Paper Mario 64 was an RPG that I can only describe as being truly Mario. But the Thousand Year Door is different. This is a game that takes everything Mario is known for and throws it out for something completely original. But it does this while still retaining that iconic Mario feel. Like, this is still unmistakably a Mario RPG, but it's also unlike anything that came before it. It was an incredibly risky move to take the series in this kind of a direction, but it was ultimately a move that paid off. Even with its flaws, this is truly a special game. It's a game that tries its hardest at every opportunity to improve on the foundation it was built upon. It takes the concept of Mario in an RPG and makes it magic again. Now, as I'm sure you're all already aware, this is the last time we'd see a Paper Mario game in this style. After the Thousand Year Door, the series would move away from its RPG roots and instead focus on action and adventure. Before playing these first two games myself, I was confused. I mean, why abandon such a beloved formula? Why not just give the fans what they want? But now that I've actually gotten to play these games, I kind of get it? Like, where could they have gone from here? The Thousand Year Door pretty much perfected everything with this style. If they continue making games like this year after year like the fans want, well, then these entries wouldn't be as special. I mean, just take a look at the Mario and Luigi games, for example. Even after the series peaked, they continued to follow the same old formula game after game until they literally ran it into the ground. As much as I hate to admit it, changing things up after the Thousand Year Door was without a doubt the smartest thing intelligent systems could have done. Instead of completely milking this style of game for everything it's worth, they chose to end on a high note and try something new. While their efforts to reinvent the series haven't always worked out, that will never change the fact that Paper Mario 64 and the Thousand Year Door are truly extraordinary. Thank you.